This is the Coton Festival, and we're at the Coton Centre on May the 18th, 1991, which is just 50 years since the demolition by Germany of the Coton Church. I have with me Mr. and Mrs. Sloan, who were here in the Neaton, and they have one or two very remarkable stories to tell us. Now, perhaps in your own words, Mr. and Mrs. Sloan, you could perhaps perhaps re recall that terrible night of the, the major blitz of Coton. Uh, in your own words, really, feel free to say, you know, stop, start, or whatever. Right. Well, I was 14 years of age on the uh, night in question. I'd been working for about a month at Joseph Ellis's Bond Street in Nuneaton, and I was in the house in 72 Cheverell Street, Coton. And apparently, uh, my sisters had great difficulty in waking me when the air raid siren, when the warning sign went up sounded um, and we went down to the Anderson shelter in the garden in Cheverell Street and the shelter was very near an adjacent house which was, I always thought was threatening I thought if ever a bomb demolishes that house we shall be trapped anyway um, it was obvious that it was severe rain no, nothing like what we'd experienced before um, terrible noise of bombs coming down etc and the, it was very damp in the air raid shelter and one was very glad when the uh, finally the all clear went and I went off with a friend around the town and we saw craters everywhere, houses demolished we went in Edward Street and then along to Queen's Road and well everywhere there was a pool of dust and a smell, I can still smell it now it, it smelt like, well, what I imagine gunpowder was like. I've never experienced anything like it before. And one of my s younger sister went along Cheverell Street to Fitton Street School, which was appeared to be on fire, and the children started cheering, hoping the school would be burnt down. <laughs> Opposite <laughs> our house, a lady was opening the door, and um, a piece of a bomb collided with her but fortunately she's wearing corsets and all she was severely bruised. She's rather a large lady and she said that um, the best advice she could give people was to always wear corsets and then you'd be safer when the bombs exploded. Um, in daylight the next day um, the, the scenery of the town was most impressive, there were tiles missing from roofs all over the place and the rafters were bare as if a, the hand of God or a giant had clutched them and taken them away. Um, I went to work the next morning at Ellis's and the old manager said to me, go up the station and get the, whack, the labels out of the railway wagons. Well I went up the road and I was turned back because it was said that there were unexploded bombs about so I went and told him I couldn't get to the station but he said you've got to get through lad so I got through the back of a house at the top of Bond Street and did my job and we all carried on doing our job in those days we didn't let a few bombs stop us from carrying on with life and at lunchtime I went up Attleborough Road to my aunt's which I always did for my dinner but the house wasn't there <laughs> and my uncle apparently all he'd got was the clothes he'd worn the night before and they'd lost everything but the parrot survived. Its cage was bent, but the bird itself had lost its feathers, but it still lived. Um, Don't be tempted. Uh, those are the <laughs> items that I can remember. That's fantastic. <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Sloan a question, mainly about her Weddington memories of Ventnor Street. I have been doing some research on Ventnor Street, but I have not had it so vividly recalled as Mrs. Sloan will now tell us. Well, I was 11 years of age on the night of the Blitz. It was actually the day after my 11th birthday. So my memories are a little bit hazy. Um, I do remember being woken by mother and we, she managed to get myself, my sister and my um, elder brother 
in, under the table, first of all, because the bombs were falling, there was so much noise, we couldn't get out of the house. Mm. We spent some time under the table. Uh, my father was working on an afternoon shift. My, elder, my eldest brother was actually um, a messenger, and he was out on duty. And suddenly, we just got sheets of glass and splinters coming under the table. Um, the windows had broken, and they came sort of caved in. Then we progressed from the house to the bicycle sheds in Heim Lane School, because around there we were not allowed to use, have our own shelters, we had to use the public shelters, which were quite some, some way away to get on a bad night. And then from there we got in, eventually made the shelters. My recollections of the shelter were a little bit um, hazy. We had beds made up for the children, and we were sort of they hoped that we would sleep through, but it was just too noisy. The bombs were really, really bad that night. When we got home, it must have been about seven in the morning before we were allowed out of the, back to our own home, and Mum was just sort of warming us up. She'd made some hot porridge, and the, we had a knock at the door, and my aunt came in, and she, was, she burst into tears and she said, Oh, thank God you're all right. We've lost everything. Uh, my aunt lived in Ventnor Street and she and my uncle had two evacuees staying with them. They'd been sent from Lowestoft for safety. The four of them were in an Anderson shelter in their garden and the bomb must have landed more or less on one of the row of houses. I think four houses were completely demolished and several others were quite badly damaged. Mm -hmm. My father and by then had returned home from work. My father went back with my uncle and my two brothers went with them to help dig and see what they could find and find out. And in the house next door to my aunt, there was just no trace of anyone, but the occupants never were traced. Um, it was just bits of flesh all over the place. Um, Three days afterwards, they found two bodies which were seemed to have been unscathed, but they were sheltered by the falling masonry, and it must have been blast that killed them. I think altogether seven people were killed. There was a, a Mrs. Payne and her little daughter, Brenda, who would be about three years of age, I think. Her husband was away in the forces. There was a family named Lowe, Mrs. Lowe, her daughter Janet, and Mrs. Lowe's sister, Ethel, who lived with them. And then there was a family named Young, I think the mother and daughter there were killed. And I can't remember the names of the others, but I believe there were seven, about seven or eight people killed altogether. And um, they found traces of flesh, but had gone some distance, some on roofs. Uh, they found someone's head in the um, fields nearby, mm. on the sports field. But I can't remember, um, I wasn't allowed to go and see it on the day immediately after the, um, after the blitz. Mother kept myself and my younger sister indoors. My brothers were allowed to go out and see, so I sort of got a second hand from them what was being found, what was going on. I think we were a little bit protected, my sister and I, and mother tried to hush things up and mm -hmm. hope that we wouldn't be too bothered by it all. Yes, as, as you were describing the tragedy, I, I myself didn't realise that, that uh, human beings were involved like this. And uh, Mr Sloan has just reminded me of another incident where, again, people uh, and tragedy are sometimes ignored or sometimes very, very um, poignant in what they do to people's memories. So if you'd like to yeah. just sort of say a few words. Um, I remember my younger sister, Margaret, going along uh, into Frank Street and she saw the rescue workers getting a body out of a house um, with some other children. She was standing there and then they brought but the dead dog out and they um, didn't appreciate what had happened to the human person but they started crying because they saw the dog was dead mm -hmm. and then I remember my wife's brother telling me that in Weddington when he w they went to where the damage had occurred 
um, they had to get baskets were issued to them to pick up the remains of human beings that had been killed and then they saw a, a dog running off carrying part of a, a body mm. but uh, being only 14 years of age and with my friends we were excited about it really rather than appreciating the um, human suffering I think we thought it was an exciting affair and we never experienced anything like it before or since. No, I'm sure you couldn't. Um, and that's the impression that re remains with me. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Philip Vernon. I've known him for some years, he lives in Poolbank Street, a uh, great historian and uh, thankfully Phil's going to talk a little bit about his wartime memories and if they're as good as everything else that Phil remembers they'll be brilliant because he's got a photographic memory and uh, Phil generally says something and it's usually spot on. So over to you, Phil, with some of your memories about uh, World War II. Hi, Phil, any time you like that. I can well remember the date of the German Blitz on the Neaton because May the 17th, 1941, would have been the um, birthday, 48th birthday anniversary of my father, so the date well sticks in my mind. I was just 16 years of age at the time and had been working at Connors Printing Works in Vicarage Street. But when I finished work at 6pm on the Friday evening and looked around the workshop, little did I think that the next time I would see it, it would merely be a heap of smouldering cinders. Um, I went to bed that night, thinking of nothing in particular, but can remember my mother standing by the bedside and getting very, very irate and saying, Philip, will you please get up? I keep calling you. The Germans are over and they're dropping bombs. Hey, what? I says, dreamy. Then there was the most terrific bang or explosion I've ever heard in my life, which of course was one of the bombs dropping. Needless to say, I sprang out of the bed like lightning then, got dressed, and we all went up to the Anderson shelter that was in the back garden. Um, then, of course, bombs were dropping, um, you know, the, the bombs came whistling down, were dropping all around us. And then across towards um, Mount Street, which would be about 200 yards from my home, there was a brilliant flash in the sky, and then the ground shook, and then I heard the explosion. And, of course, it made me realise that the sound waves travelled so much quicker than the... Um, than the, the uh, actual sight, so it was a bit unusual to see the flash first and actually hear the bang uh, quite a second or two after. And that uh, was the nearest bomb that we'd had to our house, but there was to one come much closer, and this dropped just at the back of Porter's Ironmonger's shop off Queen's Road. And that was so close that the only thing I remember of that was the feel of my stomach suddenly left my stomach and came up into my mouth and shot back down again and that's the best way I can describe it. And then there was an absolute rain of brick ends, tiles and what was peltering and pattering down onto the um, roof of the underground and Anderson shelter we were in. Uh, and that was the very closest I've ever had a bomb drop and uh, what's more I hope it's going to be the last one that dropped as close as that because it was a bit... Uh, off-putting to say the least. Of course the blitz went on and then when it was all over we went down into the house and followed my parents upstairs to the bedrooms which was difficult because they were absolutely littered with broken brick and debris so we went up and of course the bedroom furniture had got very badly damaged and I can well remember now I can see my mum bursting into tears and crying when she saw the furniture and the house that she had worked so very, very hard at that time to make um, so badly damaged and an impartial ruination. Of course, it would be a sad blow to her. Anyway, we must have had a cup of tea, but when it got daylight, my mum suggested that uh, we should take a walk down the town and see what damage had been done. And all down Queen's Road, I think most of the shop windows would have been broken and all the pavement and roads were littered with broken glass, brick ends and roofing tiles. 
Um, we went over the town bridge and a gentleman bystander told us that Connor's Printing Works was, had been completely burnt out, so we decided to go round. There was one fireman with a portable pump and single hose there, and he was spraying, spraying his water hose on literally onto just a heap of cinders. And um, somehow, I don't know, but the sort of shock of the whole thing suddenly started to take hold. And I turned to the fireman and says, they can't do this. He says, this is where I work. He says, it's where you did work, um, but you won't work there anymore. And he then informed us that he, was, he had come over from Burton-on-Trent Fire Brigade. Anyway, we made our way back home and the backyard of our house was absolutely littered in um, um, bricks and tile, roofing tiles. So we all set to with shovels and a wheelbarrow and cleared the yard. And I think most people, we, we, we took it in the barrow and they were putting it out in heaps on the roadway outside the houses. Um, I can't remember much of that day, but... I seem to remember very shortly afterwards it started to rain quite torrentially and there were several large holes in my roof and the water was cascading in. So then I was assisting my parents in trying to remove what furniture we could downstairs uh, to save any further damage to what had already taken place. Um, Possibly at the time, I suppose with the rain coming, it did possibly help in um, preventing possibly the spread of diseases which could have occurred, I suppose. But uh, it didn't help, of course, as I say, in, um, it didn't certainly assist in um, doing any, you know, helping the state of the furniture which had already been damaged anyway. Phil. I'm mindful that you lost your place of work, Connors, it was bombed. So what happened? Where did you go to work after that and what was your story? Uh, well, of course, we were in the midst of the war and uh, regrettably sort of on the wrong side of things at that time in 1941. Mm. And everybody then had to go to war work of some kind. So I got a job in um, Coventry. But um, I didn't think much of the job, I didn't really like it, but uh, one thing I do remember is getting to the job, which we went by train from the Neaton Trent Valley Station, and every morning these trains would leave at ten minutes intervals, about four or five of them, um, perhaps nine or ten non-corridor coaches, which were absolutely packed with people, and um, two railway enthusiasts, enthusiast I would say that the locomotive hauling us was often an old web 242 tank now bear in mind these locomotives were just about had it they were many many years old and they were being expected to to haul loads about three times as heavy as had ever been constructed but they were a plucky little locomotive and they struggled up the Coton Bank and stopped at Coton and then we made it up the charity bank to Bedworth and uh, we almost came to a standstill, but I can only remember twice when, uh, when the engine completely failed. This was usually due to the rails being wet and we had to send for assistance on the back. But um, those plucky little 242 tank locomotives doing about four times the work that they've ever been designed for, you know, is um, the plucky way they tackle those two, uh, two inclines uh, is, you know, one thing that's stuck in my memory. Right. Well, I know certainly uh, Webb and all his uh, empire are uh, close to Peter's heart as well as um, other, you know, other railway enthusiast hearts. You mentioned, I think some time ago when I spoke to you, about the electricity work that you were involved with. Was that before the oh, war no, or that after the was, war? That was after the war, right. Alan, yes, when I went on the electricity. So how department. did you get to places like Bramcote and Linley? Airfields. Right, well, as I say, the war was on and everyone had to do war work of some kind. Mm -hmm. Even the civilians didn't get called up for the forces, had to do war work. And then I got directed to go and work up at the RAF airfield up at Lindley, which is now the Motor Industries mm -hmm. Research, but it was an airfield then. Yes. Um, wow. The RAF, it was actually an advanced training uh, airfield, you know, the, the pilots, navigators and wireless operators. 
Uh, when they'd finished their course at Lindley, of course, they were ready for doing operational flights over Germany. Uh, one place they went to regular from Lindley was up to Reykjavik in Iceland, which was a 900-mile run. That was to get these people really trained for long-distance flying. And uh, these were mainly Wellington bombers. But um, I've got one or two memories of um, we were working on the airfield, and it would be late in November on a dark dark afternoon going towards dusk and there was a plane coming in to land and someone in the group said what's that light on the back and we could see what appeared to be a light but as it got closer we saw he says it's not a light the back the back of the plane is well alight and of course the the pilot didn't land on the runway he brought it down on the grass and when it finally <laughs> came to a halt the the whole of the back half of the plane was just one mass of flames and they slid open the um, cockpit roof mm -hmm. and one by one there was three crew members and they dropped to the ground. Now, one thing stuck in my memory is that they didn't start to run and leave their comrades. Each man that dropped to the ground, although they were about to be engulfed in flames, he waited till the last man had dropped and they all started to uh, run away from the plane. Bearing in mind they were in thick boots and flying gear and could hardly run at all. And they were just about have gone um, far enough from the plane when there was a terrific bang. And of course, that was the petrol tanks and the thing literally blew to bits. And the fire tender, which had set off from the watch office, he was going to take a short cut across the grass. But of course, it had been raining heavily and he got sort of bogged down and uh, the plane just had to burn out. Um, another time I remember... Um, there were two Wellington bombers coming into land, both trying to come in at the same time. Obviously, some mm -hmm. confusion with the signals. And the chap in there um, used to be like a caravan painted in black and white checks, an airfield control, I suppose. And he had um, a pistol, I think you call it a Veery pistol, it fires um, signal lights. Yes. And he started to bang, bang red flares up in the sky as hard and fast as he could go. And these planes were just about within feet of each other, about to collide, when they both saw the red flares and must have seen each other, and one veered to the left and one to the right and just averted a very nasty accident. But another one I can remember is, it was raining torrentially, and my workmate and I, we'd only be chaps 18 at the time, hmm. it was t we'd rain, run into this, uh, what they call a, a slit trench, you know, for the personnel to get in if yes. there was a raid. And um, pouring the rain and there's such a terrific roaring in the sky and then bong, goodness, what was that? And we poked our heads out and across on the grass was just, just like smoke rising off the ground. And we ran across and there wouldn't, apart from the fact the grass was smouldering, there wouldn't have been a piece of metal as big as a watch chain, but what it actually had been, it was a spitfire that it, uh, it literally hit the ground head on. And there wasn't a piece of that plane as big as a watch, as I say, a watch chain. And that was another vivid memory I've got. That's amazing. Mm. The whole thing totally destroyed on impact. It would do, yes, absolutely disintegrated, yes, in one puff of smoke, yeah. Do, do you remember if there were any bomb hits at Linley or Myra or um, Bramcott? Bramcott, I believe, had one because the German bomber then followed one of our aircraft in and, of course, they'd got the landing light, lights on and they thought he was one of their own planes coming in. Of course, it was an enemy plane and he used the uh, lighting facilities to drop a stick of bombs across. But I've no actual memories of Lindley ever being hit, not directly, but there were several bombs dropped around because away from the airfield, the, the um, air ministry had built sort of dummy runways mm -hmm. and the eye was, yes. idea was to distract <coughs> enemy bombers away from the actual airfield. So the, the German planes did have a go at bombing one or two of those, but... Um, the ruse sort of worked because they didn't hit the airfield itself. Hmm, that's correct. I, I've been told by, uh, I think it's Ron Beasley, uh, of this Weddington dummy airfield in the fields yes, at the back that, of the that railway. Yes, that would be so, yes. And apparently that was regularly bombed. Bombed, yes. The farmers yes. would plough, yes. collect all the shrapnel, mm. and then restore the lights. 
yeah. and it would go on stream the next night as a decoy. That is uh, true. Yes. I can tell you something else um, regarding that because after hostilities, and even although I worked up Lindley, I was unaware of this, but out in the fields across towards the village of Upton, they had built um, what we used to call the watch office or the control tower for the airfield. Mm -hmm. They had built a dummy watch office just out of plywood sheets. And what the idea was, if enemy aircraft were over, they would light this, this dummy watch tower up, uh, again, to act as a decoy, so the enemy bombers would think, oh, there's the watch tower, and they would bomb a field full of potatoes. <laughs> and although, as I say, I was working at Lindley, I was completely unaware myself of this dummy watchtower, which shows how well the secret must have been kept. Yes. Phil, can you tell us about the, the Lindley airfield? Where was the entrance to it? Was it the Watling Street or the Fen Lane? Or I should say the, the official one was off the Fen Lanes because that was where they had the, um, the what do you call it, the guard room. The, the military police had the guard room oh. at that entrance. Mm. There was another entrance which you went down Station Road, Higham and over the Ashby Line Railway Bridge onto the airfield. Mm. That was another entrance. And the third unofficial entrance was off the Watling Street, um, just the red gate side of um, the, I think it's known as the Hungry Bridge on the Watling Street. But that is a road that where the, the uh, contractors had, you know, brought their um, building materials, and it wasn't sort of an official one, but one or two used it. But the official entrance would have been off the Fen Lane where the guard room was, yes. Do you remember, Phil, much about the actual construction of the Lindley site? Because it's very, very flat now, and I get the impression it was a bit more undulating, and somebody must have graded that flat. It's so artificially it, flattened all over the area. Well, now. it was a, an airfield, of course, there's got to be reasonably well, flat. Correct. You couldn't you have, have an airfield yeah. on the hillside, but <clears> it wasn't completely flat because the land tended to drop down towards the Fen Lanes and sort of rise up, I should say the field rose slightly, coming back towards the A5 Watling Street. Yes. Just slightly, yes. but, um, yeah. I think probably the same for Bramcote. I mean, Bramcote is largely a flat area yeah. again, but mm. again, you get the feeling that some of it must have been artificially flattened by graders or bulldozers. Oh, or oh it would, have been, it would yes. have been. It was a flat site. That's why mm. it was chosen, chosen in both cases. Mm. But yes, yes, there would have been a lot of uh, levelling work done. But even so, it wasn't, as I say, completely flat, but it's enough as, as near as it mattered for flying purposes, yeah. yeah. Um, what about unexploded bombs, Philip? Do you have any memories of unexploded bombs? Yes, I do. A very vivid one, and um, this is even going back before the Blitz on the Neat, and I would be aged 15 then. And uh, being aged 15, you're uh, full of adventure, wartime or not, and what's going on around you, it was all new to us. Well, it was new to everybody, I know, but we were that age, you know, impressionable age. And my friend said, let's ride over to Coventry and see the blitz damage, because they were having blitz raids before we did. And to me, I was, we were cycling along the Foles Hill Road when there's a terrific bang, and there's all bricks and tiles, and I remember, finding myself then, unexplainably, in the gutter, lying by the side of my bicycle. And a man running across and says, are you all right? And I picked myself up and says, I thought it was, and I wasn't quite sure. But there was no, no like, really, apart from scravings, I wasn't uh, badly injured. But it was enough for my friend and I. We'd had enough of adventure and bombs, bombs for that day. And he suggested that he thought it was now time, perhaps we made our way back to Nuneaton, and I all too readily agreed with him. So we couldn't get out to Coventry quick enough on our bikes after that. No. I was looking at the civil defence records and found the Blackertree Road unexploded bomb, but it doesn't actually give the location. It gives the crater uh, as five feet diameter, three feet deep, mm, yeah. um, but no location other than Blackertree Road. Uh, uh, I can't remember that one. I can remember that an unexploded bomb dropped somewhere in the vicinity of the River Anchor, sort of at the back of where the bus station now yes, is. Yes, yes, that's right. And um, that was before the...